How many of you have like Easter traditions that you like to do with your family? Okay, most people in the room. So one of the things that we have in our, in our family is we do an Easter egg hunt. And so I wanted to share the tradition with you. So we're going to do a little Easter egg hunt here this morning. Um, if you have the spirit of legalism, we just, we'll talk later, okay? But let's have, that was my joke, okay. We're just going to do a little fun. And one of, the, one of the parts of our tradition, and hunting for Easter eggs is people looking for new life, right? And so when the, I'm making this theological now, right? So when the women went to the tomb, they discovered new life. And so now searching for little chicks and bunnies is all about new life. And really they're, they're kind of on the right track, but they miss it, okay? But we're going to do it, we're going to do it, um, you know, we're going to do a glorified Easter egg hunt, okay? Because the Easter egg you're going to find in the room is gold, all right? And so one of the traditions in my household is my mom would find these chrome gold eggs and stuff, some dollars in it, and she does that with, um, no longer with me. I wish I wish I still got those, but now my, my sons get to experience from their grandma. And so under one of the seats is a gold egg. So you want to check underneath your seat right now. I do have a gift. There's no money in it, but there is a gift. Um, Maybe if Pastor Daniel can come into the room and fi- help us. I think it's supposed to be somewhere over in that area. I think I saw him <laughs> place it over there. So maybe if you want to move around in like that area, don't shove anyone on the ground. It's not like a real, yeah, the kids, hurry. Yeah, you guys can go over and look for it, sure. I do have a... Um, Pastor Daniel, if you're hearing somewhere in cyberspace, come back in the room and help us find it. Well, that was very anticlimactic. All right. It is somewhere over, I think, in that general 20-chair region over there. Does anyone else not do Easter egg hunts? Or maybe in the past you did them or something? Yeah? Okay. Today, if we're... Pastor Daniel did. I saw him. It's taped to the bottom of the chair. Did I not say that? Oh. Well, I can't just have it on the ground. Someone's going to be like, hey, someone left the egg and you'll throw it away. And I don't want that. What is he doing? Oh, he's eating a donut. Uh, he went to get his family. What a, what a kind of... All right. Well, when he gets back, we'll check it. We'll check it a little later. It's not like going to rot. Okay. If you're at home, go hide an egg and find it, and then put in the comments that you found it faster than we did. Yes. I can't, I cannot testify to what is under there. I do know that an egg was put there. We'll figure that out a little bit later. If it's not, um, gosh, that made that. that. I have a journal for whoever finds it. So if you if you find it, you can come up and get a journal here a little bit later today. All right. We worship God here by singing songs. We also worship God by giving the Lord his tithe and offering. I just want to remind everybody that we have giving stations in the back. So at some point today, if you've prepared your tithe and offering, you can drop those box, drop it off in the boxes there. Bev did a great job of reading the scripture. Let me pray, and then we'll get into the message. And I, I know sometime today we'll find that egg, I promise, all right? God, we thank you so much for who you are, and we thank you that by your great power, you rose Jesus from the grave. And Lord Jesus, we thank you. We are beyond grateful for the fact that you are the resurrection. You are the life. And you call us and beckon us to believe in you so that we may have that life, that life that is only found in you, the life that you mediate to us in your love and your grace. So in your name we pray, amen. amen. Have you ever been um, a place or a time in your life where you needed help beyond yourself? Someone raised their hand right away. Have you ever got to this point in life where maybe there was, there was a sense in which you needed to cry out for help? You needed, again, help beyond yourself. What you had, the resources you had at hand, it just didn't hold up to the problem you were facing. For me, I remember in uh, 2020, early 2020, um, and I remember the day because it like happened on a, a leap year day in February, so February 29th, 2020, um, I remember I had to take my youngest son to the ER because he had, um, 
he had um, contracted this virus, and, and, or well, we still don't really know the true source of it, but what happened is it caused this full body rash. And he had broken out in this rash, and it wasn't just like, oh, I'm a little itchy. It was like me, because, because when it comes to my wife and I, I'm the one who usually goes to the hospital. I'm usually the one who sits with the owies and the boobas at the hospital, all right, because I can usually just kind of handle those situations better. But at our house, I remember he had just broken out with this, this rash that was so painful that he, as, as a one-year-old at this time, almost turning to, he was flipping and screaming in the bed, and I was just trying to comfort him totally and trying to be there for him. And I realized I just, I just, there's nothing I can do for him. I needed help beyond, like I had been praying. We had been like asking tons of people to pray. And it was just to the point where we needed to go to the ER because he stopped eating. He stopped drinking any liquids. Um, and if you know my son, he loves water. Like that's the only liquid he'll have, which is interesting because my other son, like he just wants sugary stuff. But my, other, my youngest wants water only. He wouldn't drink water. He wouldn't eat anything. So we had to take him. A one-year-old had to get an IV in him. We were sitting in the, finally after like an hour and a half of being in the ER through an IV, he finally started calming down and finally took a bite of a cracker. But I remember that was a moment that I, I needed help beyond myself. And I mentioned that today because our story um, for this last I am statement kind of jumps right into a scene in which sisters need help from Jesus that is beyond themselves, right? They cannot no longer deal with their brother who is sick. And so they reach out to help. They ask Jesus to come and to see him. And, and we get to the story where Bev, where Bev started speaking. It says on his arrival, all right? So let's take the next few minutes just to talk about the story. What's going on here? Because this is the last I am statement. We've been talking about in the gospel of John, Jesus will say these statements that start with I am, and then we'll finish with a predicate. I am am the, and he talks about being the bread of life. He talks about being the light of the world. He talks about being the way, the truth, and the life, the, the gate, and the good shepherd. He talks about being the true vine. And, and today, we're going to go through this last one where he says, I am the resurrection and the life. But the statement, I am the resurrection and the life, again, it happens in the middle of a story. It says, Jesus arrived and then Martha came out to him. So we have to figure out what's going on here. And really the story is found in the larger chapter of John chapter 11. So if you have your Bibles, let's stay in there for a second. We'll, we'll go to a couple other passages. But we're going to stay in John chapter 11 um, for today. And it starts off by giving us some context that, that Lazarus is sick. And Lazarus' sisters, Mary and Martha, are deeply concerned for him, and so they reach out to Jesus. And, and the story begins kind of like a, like a puzzle, if you will, because there's a lot of things that we just kind of don't understand. Because when Jesus gets word that Lazarus is sick, he says, this sickness will not end in death, but it is for God's glory that it has come, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. As we read that, we might think, well, what is going on? Like, why is that what Jesus is saying? He declares that basically death isn't going to have the final say in this. God's glory will get the final say in here. There's also a puzzle because the disciples then caution him. They go, well, Jesus, you can't go back to where Lazarus lives. It says that he was in, Lazarus lived in Bethany, which is a village outside of Jerusalem. They are currently in the story. They are currently in a different Bethany Miles away, like a full day's journey, There's, there were two Bethanies. They were in the other Bethany, the Bethany they're in. People believe in Jesus. They see the wonderful things. And so that's good Bethany. And the disciples are like, why would we go to this bad Bethany? Don't you remember the last time we were there, people were trying to kill you, Jesus? And I love it how, how Jesus is willing to die so that Lazarus may live. I mean, isn't that like the heart of the gospel right there? He's going to go over to bad Bethany, dangerous Bethany. They cautioned him, don't go. The last time you were there, they wanted to kill you. Why would you go back? And he's like, I have to go there because Lazarus is dead and I have to raise him from the dead. He needs to live. I'd be willing to go and die so that Lazarus may live. The disciples, uh, they, they're confused. After they caution him, they're like, wait, because Jesus says, well, he's fallen asleep. He's using the euphemism there of, of death. He goes, so I got to go wake him up. And they're like, well, if he's sleeping, that's going to be good, right? Because he's going to rest and get better. He's like, no, no, let me tell you plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe, 
but let us go to him. Interesting, right? This is the puzzling part of the story is somehow Jesus is saying the death of Lazarus is good for the disciples. And why? Good for their faith. For some reason, death can be good for faith of followers of Jesus. Don't really understand why quite yet, but we're going to get there. And then Thomas speaks up before they leave, before they leave bad Bethany to go to good Bethany. He speaks up and he says, um, let's go also too with Jesus so that we may die with him. Like he just, he just doesn't really understand it. Like he's going to bad Bethany. They're going to kill him. Let's just go so we can die with him. And Thomas again still is, is missing the mark, if you will. So this is the story that we find ourselves in before we get to chapter 11, verse 17. It says, on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. We start out with a puzzle. What's going on? Why is this going to end in glory? Why is death not going to get the final say? And why did Jesus stay? He stayed in Bethany for two days before he even left. And, and why would he go to a place that wants to kill him? All this, this, the puzzling details of early on in chapter 11 are now met with the pain experienced by Martha. She is without hope. Back in that time, they believed that at four days, there is no hope for someone who, who might be able to come back to life. So four days is interesting for this, for this section. She is now without hope. The pain she's experienced, the grief that she's going through through a loss of a brother is magnified here in this passage. Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. And when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. When I usually used to read that, I used to read that as this, oh, because Martha has this amazing faith, right? Oh, Jesus, if you had just been here, like, Oh, and then recently if I have experienced loss in my life. I've experienced grief. I, I, I know what it's like to go there. I know what it's like to be with someone who is grieving. And I can imagine the anger in her voice. Yes, it's a faith claim. Yes, I know that if you would have been here, something would happen. But I can imagine the anger, the pain that is expressed through her anger. Right? She, she already went through shock in somewhere. Maybe there's a little bit of shock. Maybe there's a little bit of disbelief. Maybe there's a little bit of anger. Maybe there's a little bit of sadness. The stages of grief coming out at Jesus. If you would have been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. In other words, you still got to do something about this, Jesus. And I love his response. Does he defend himself? Uh, Martha, I actually had to stay a couple extra days. There was a couple, there was like a, you know, like a repayment. I had to, someone had to pray for three other people. Like, can you imagine the amount of miracles I've done these last few days? Can't I just rest? No, he doesn't. In her pain and in her grief and in her anger of loss of her brother, she goes right at him. And what does he do? He just sits there and takes it. Reminds me that God can take us in our biggest amounts of anger, our biggest amounts of emotion and pain, God's able to handle it. He's able to deal with us. In fact, he wants us to be raw and real in our emotions in what we're going through. He doesn't defend himself for taking two days to get there. Remember, it's only a day's journey. And he could have made the argument, well, by the time your person left to come tell us, Lazarus was already dead. He's been dead for four days now. So I couldn't have even got here in time. But he didn't do that. He just let her speak to him. Then he, he does answer and he says, well, your brother will rise again. And this is the promise of the story. We go from a puzzle, not knowing what's going on, to we go to pain of Martha, the loss of her brother, to now a promise by Jesus. And Jesus says, your brother will rise again. And Martha doesn't really quite get it. She goes, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Yeah, Jesus, I get it. It's way out there in the future. That was the common belief at the time. Jews believed that resurrection would come at the end of this age. It would actually signify the coming of the age to come. The arrival of the age to come would be at the resurrection. And so she goes, I I know it's going to be a future thing. And then we get to the I am statement. probably, Probably the most audacious claim he has ever made up to this point. 
I know I did a little, little reordering of the I am statements, but I really wanted to do the resurrection and the life here on Easter Sunday. So I know last week we went ahead to John 15. The week before that, we we're in John 14. Now we're going back to John 11. But anyway, he says this. I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Again, the I am statement. This is, in a way, Jesus connecting himself to Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament, the Lord God of the Old Testament. And he's been doing this all along. I mentioned it earlier, but again, he says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I am the vine. And here, the final statement that we're going to go through for this series is, I am the resurrection and the life. And if you're taking notes, this is what the word resurrection means. I've been doing this as I've been up here preaching. I've been kind of trying to define the words for you so we understand what he's saying in the midst of the story that he says it. And here, resurrection refers to new bodily life after being dead. A new bodily life, a new physical reality after a time of being dead. It, this isn't ghosts. This isn't zombies, all right? You, you share this story with like little kids now and they're like, oh, Jesus was a zombie. And I'm like, oh, no. He doesn't go around eating, never mind, I'm just not going to go there on Easter morning, all right? But he's not referring to ghosts. These aren't souls escaping the body. That was a Greek thought. The Greeks thought that the, that the body was the, the prison of the soul. And so once you would die, the, the, the prison would finally be, uh, the gates would be wide open and the soul could finally rele be released and rise up to the greater cosmos. This is not what he's talking about. These aren't spiritual bodies, they're like holograms, right? I don't know how many conspiracy, 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 conspiracy theorists, I was going to say conspiracy theorists, I don't know. Conspiracy theorists are out there, You're like the holograms of the Pope who appeared in like the window and then they got, no, this isn't a hologram. This is physical life. This is not a way to describe death. Oh, he's right, he's risen, he is, no, this is a new kind of reality, a new physical life after a period of being dead. Now, resurrection in that time, the pagans didn't believe in it. They had a word for it. It's right here. I don't want to bore you with the Greek language, all right, but it's, that's, they know the word, but that's not what they use for life after death. Pagans didn't even think that was possible. Remember, they thought in, in the afterworld. You see that in Greek mythology, and the underworld and all the different lowercase g gods that we know about through schooling and all that. But the pagans didn't think resurrection, this new bodily life after a period of being dead, they didn't believe that was possible. The Jews, most of them believed it would happen, right? The Pharisees, some other groups of Jews believed that. The Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. And like I said before, and that's why they're sad, you see, because they didn't believe in the resurrection. The later services will laugh at that, I know, okay. They only thought, though, that resurrection would happen at the end of the age in which they were living, which would signify the arrival of the age to come. Jesus talks about his understanding of, of this resurrection in chapter 5, verse 24 of John. He says, Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. Very truly I tell you, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to judge because he is the son of man. And do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. By myself I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just. For I seek not to please myself, but to please him who sent me. Jesus understands about that future resurrection. He gets it. Christians writing after Jesus had raised, they're the ones who said it actually happened. God's future age arrived in the resurrection of Jesus, the day that we're celebrating today, a couple thousand years after the most amazing miracle of all, God actually defeats death and raises his son to resurrection life. 
Again, it's a new kind of bodily, a new physical, a new tangible life after a period of dead. That is resurrection. Jesus doesn't have the keys to it. He doesn't have the secret sauce to the resurrection. He is the resurrection and the life. The word life here, it's, it's a word we've seen a lot. Here's another definition. It's the transcendent or the eternal life from God. This is different from the word bios, right? The word bios in Greek talks about like natural life. Like that's where we get the word biology, a life that will, that actually is just decaying. As soon as it starts, it's a life that is decaying. It's, it's, the Bible would describe it as from dust to dust. It's, that's the bios. But when God gives you life, he doesn't give you bios again, a new bios. He gives you a new zoe life. So I'm boring you with a little bit of Greek language, but just bear with me here. This word life It's a key theme throughout this I Am series. We've heard it a lot, the bread of life, the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus says, as the good shepherd in the gate, he says, I've come that they may have life and have it overflowing, abundant life. Life is a key theme throughout this series. It's for spiritual nourishment. It's abundance. Jesus is the only way to God because the eternal life of God is in him. He just says that God has granted me with This life, this Zoe life, the life that doesn't die, the life that goes on and on, the life that is only of and from God. He says, remember, if you want to be connected to the true vine, you will have life. I've said before that these seven I am statements, when they're connected to the seven signs and talked about alongside the seven discourses, they all center on this Zoe life that is found only in Jesus. And again, Jesus doesn't testify about this life. He doesn't explain it. No secret sauce here. He says he is the life. He is the eternal life of God. And so what does he mean by the resurrection and the life? Jesus means that he mediates resurrection and eternal life to anyone who believes in him. If you're taking notes, that's your next little fill in the blank. He mediates resurrection and eternal life to anyone who believes in him. Again, he doesn't claim to possess it like he has it or something like that. He doesn't claim to know the secrets about it. He doesn't claim to have the special formula to get it. He just claims audaciously that he is the resurrection and life. It's a bold, audacious, out of this world claim. I am the resurrection. I am this Zoe life, one without beginning and without ending. I am the fullness of life for you. Well, I get excited about this. And so the mediation then, Jesus brings this resurrection. Jesus brings this life to those who believe in him, to those who lean into him, to those who want to be a part of what he's doing, those who entrust themselves completely to him. He mediates that resurrection and that life to them. And that's not the end of the story because now the rest of the story will point forward to when Jesus raises from the dead. Let's look at it. It says, yes, Lord. She said, he says, do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. And after she said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. And the teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. And when Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. And when the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. And when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Pain again, anger again, a different sister bringing it to Jesus. And I love it in verse 33, when he saw her weeping. And the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked, come and see, Lord. They replied, Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. Just a little side note. I love it. Sometimes going through loss, going through grief and pain, the question is, God, where are you in the midst of it? And I love how Jesus is right there weeping alongside two sisters who are devastated at the loss of their brother. 
He's not throwing theological jargon on him. He just made the most audacious claim, and he's going to prove it here in a little bit. But he's taking the time to sit with them, to weep with them, to the whole community that loved that family so much that they would be there with him. And it troubles him to see their hurt and their pain. And so what does he do? He goes and he weeps alongside of them. That's just a side note. And then, of course, you have some of the people, because this is the dangerous part of Bethany, is this, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man kept this man from dying? And Jesus once more deeply moved. He now has a little bit of, mm, okay, here we go. It's time to, time to roll. He came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. And I want you to hear some of the imagery. A stone was across the entrance. And he says, take away the stone. The same words used later on that when the stone was taken away from his grave. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odor. He's been dead. He's been there for four days. And then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, there's the word again, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Again, this is pointing forward to Jesus' resurrection. And Jesus looked up, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out. His hands and feet were wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. The interesting thing, I said that this is pointing forward to Jesus' resurrection in John chapter 20. When you get to that one, when the stone was rolled away, there was no body wrapped in cloths. And it's interesting because in John 20, I think it says three different times they were, John wants you to know that the grave clothes were on the ground. They were there. One was folded up. One was on the ground. He's like, the clothes that were wrapped around Lazarus when he came out, they're not even there for Jesus because Jesus has experienced this new bodily life after a period of being dead. Jesus brings Lazarus back to life, but Lazarus will soon die again. He brings him back, but Lazarus will die again. But when Jesus is raised from the dead, there's no need for any grave clothes. He is alive and will live that Zoe life forevermore. So, so here's the so what. So what do we do with this story, right? This is a story about Jesus raising Lazarus and Lazarus and meeting Mary and Martha in their pain and, and claiming to be the resurrection and life. So now what? This is the question for us. So what do we do with this story? The first thing I think is we have to believe. Entrust your life completely to Jesus. Now, I'm no rocket scientist, but when the word believe appears seven times in a story, you kind of want to take notice of it, all right? Six times by Jesus, in at least the translation I was reading, one time by Martha, all right, when she says, I do believe. But the word believe comes up six times by Jesus, seven if you count hers. In chapter 11, verse 14, then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, but for your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe and let us go to him. John 11, 25 through 26, anyone who believes in me, even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? And John chapter 11, verse 40, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? And then in the prayer to the Father, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I say this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you have sent me. This word believe in the word life, that Zoe life that's only found in Jesus, it's, it's a huge theme always connected in the gospel of John. In fact, at the very end of John chapter 20, um, some scholars say that John 21 was added on after that. Later, you can make that debate, but the last, in chapter 20, verse 30. One, John says, all these things in here were written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Jesus said, I, or John says, I wrote this whole gospel so that you would believe. In other words, belief really does matter. But it's not just spoken words. Oh, I believe, Jesus. You know, I came to Easter service. First time coming to church since last year. Like, yeah, I believe in Jesus. It's so much more than that. It's, it's like leaning into him. It's putting your full and complete trust in him. It's, it's being committed to him. It's, it's that line in the sand, no, I'm not going to do anything that would go against his lordship over my life. 
Whoever trusts, entrusts oneself to Jesus in complete confidence. It's full trust. It's full commitment. I asked this back when I said the way, the truth, and the life. When I preached that one and when I preached the bread of life. What is keeping you from believing, from putting your full trust in Jesus? Full commitment. What is keeping you from doing that? And another question might be, well, if this is what we're supposed to do, the so what for us, like where do I start? I think Martha gives us a really good example. She says, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God who has come into the world. John says he wrote this whole gospel so that people would say this exact statement. And I love how Martha says that statement here in our story today. No, I do believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God who has come into the world. For us, we may adapt it and say who has come into this world. We could start there. If you haven't started a relationship with Jesus or you haven't begun to go all in and start your commitment, that is a good place to start. But what's next? Well, number two, you have to receive. You have to take hold of eternal life now. Okay, future resurrection. I talked about that, right? There's a day coming when the dead will rise again. It's at the end of this age. That's what the Jews believe. I said the Christian believe, Christians believed that actually it had happened and it happened in Jesus. And John is writing this and says, if you have the son, you have life. Life starts now. This Zoe life that he's promised, the life that's different than Bios life, it starts today. If you are in Christ, you have it now. It's a present, undying, eternal life given now if you believe in him. He says this, he hints at it when he says, whoever lives by believing, like whoever lives now by believing, they just won't even die. And it's not that Jesus isn't saying you're not going to die, right? Because we'd have 2,000 year old people walking around and you're like, hey guys, how you doing? All right. We'd be like, what is going on? What he's saying is that death no longer has eternal significances if you're in Christ. Because he defeated the grave, he defeated death. If you're in the one who has Zoe life, eternal life, then death should not have any fear, any, any hold, or doesn't have any hold on you. There is no eternal significance. Amen. It's Easter. We've got the amens coming today. I love it. John will write in 1 John. He's like, by this point, he's Grandpa John, writing to a group of people that he loves. All right? In 1 John, he, he writes to them, and he says this. And at the end of his letter, he goes, And this is what God has testified. He has given us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have God's Son does not have life. I have written this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. If you are in Christ today, you have this Zoe life now. So we need to stop viewing the promise of eternal life as some kind of a weird, twisted, foolproof Christian retirement plan, right? Oh, I just can't wait to retire to get that eternal life. No, it's now. Like, you get the big paycheck now. You get to, you get to take out the inheritance now, tax-free, all right? All for you. Paul will say it similarly, sim, simil he'll say it in like manner in chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians, from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. In other words, it's not, oh, if you're good, if you fall, no, it's either you're in Christ or you're not. And he says this, though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. New creation is here. New Zoe life is here. It's available now. Live in eternal life now. It's not something in the future to wait for. It's here. The old is past. New life is here. So then how does that work its way out? Well, number three is you have to leave. So you believe, you receive, and now you leave. But actually just written live, okay? That was a bad joke. I get it, all right? It sounded better to rhyme it with leave, but really it's just live, okay? So live. Work out your new identity in God's new world. What does Jesus say to the people standing next to Lazarus? Take off his grave clothes. In other words, he's not dead anymore. Paul 
Paul uses very similar language in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 through 24. He says, You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, to put off your grave clothes. Why? Because it's being corrupted by its deceitful desires. And what's the opposite? You're supposed to be made new in the attitudes of your mind. So put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. We have to work out our new identity in God's new world. If Jesus is raised from the dead, and if you've given your life to him, and now that you have pressed into him, full, co- full, commit, full commitment, full trust, you receive eternal life. Now you live out as if you are in eternal life right now, because you are. He says, I've written this so that you may know that you have this life from God. So put off the old self with its corruption and deceitful desires. Put on the new self in the likeness of God. True righteousness, holiness, a renewed mind. If I had time, I would go through the last three chapters of Ephesians because that's all Paul does. He tells you how to live out this new life in God's new world. I'll give you a little sneak peek at it. He says, control your speech. And really this all goes to holiness. Now, holiness, not I'm better than you, but holiness is I'm other than you. Holiness, I think at some point we started to think about it as I'm holier than thou means I'm better than thou. And really holier than thou means I'm just, I'm set apart. I'm different. I'm sorry. I don't live that lifestyle anymore. That was the old self. That was me in my grave clothes. But now I have on the new self. So I'm walking this way. I'm totally other. So my speech is going to be controlled. I'm going to be kind and tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven me. I'm going to walk as a child of light and not walk in darkness. Walking as children of light means we have to walk in the truth of who God is and the truth of what God has done for us. I'm feeling it this morning. Okay. He will get to this point in chapter 5 when he says, if you're going to be filled with the Spirit, don't get drunk on wine because that leads to a whole list of other things. He just calls it debauchery. But he says, but instead, if you're going to be under the influence of a Spirit, he says, be filled with the Holy Spirit and sing psalms and, and encourage one another and speak words of life to people as you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Then he'll say, hey, wives and husbands, your marriages have to look totally holy, totally other than the world and the way the world works in marriage. Wives, you're going to have to respect your husbands. Husbands, you're going to have to love your wives and, and basically give up everything to make her look like an irradiant prize before the Lord because Christ did that for the church. It's a little more daunting for the husbands, but men, we can put our shoulders back and we can say, all right, Lord, we're going to walk that out. Say, children and parents, your relationships, your parent-child relationship have to be holy. It says slaves and masters, and we would say if you're in the workplace, your workplace relationships have to be better. And then he gets to chapter 6 of Ephesians, and he says, be strong in the Lord and be ready for spiritual battle. And that's when he says, put on the, you know, the, the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the boots of peace. Like, I've, I've, I've learned those, right? I was in Sunday school at one time. I, could, I should have got up here with armor and been like, you ready for battle? But Paul does that. For the second half of Ephesians, we'll tell this church, look, you have been raised with Christ. God has something for you to do, so you have to work it out. Because the reality is, is this. The question I opened with, have you ever had a time where you needed help beyond yourself? The reality is, is, Every single human being has sinned and has fallen short of God's glory. We have been infected with sin to our core. And I know in 2023, it doesn't sound good to have someone tell you how wretched you are without Christ. But that's the reality. Because of the wretchedness of sin, human beings are deserving of wrath. Because of sin, God will will unleash his wrath on sin. But God chose to unleash his wrath on his son. And, And Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. He died the death. Remember, he was willing to die so that we might live. We all need help beyond ourselves. We can't change our sinful nature. We can't change our situation that we are alienated from God, deserving of wrath. We can't change it, but God did do something to change it for us. He sent Jesus who on his death on the cross, he says, this is my body which is broken for you. This is my blood which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. 
He defeated sin on the cross. And on Easter morning, he rose from the grave and defeated death. And so he has the authority and the power to give eternal life to those who put their full trust, full commitment, full faith in him. So whether you realize it or not, you do need help beyond yourself. And God in his grace and mercy offers that help today. He offers Zoe life today. Will you bow your heads with me? Lord, if there's anyone in the room who might want to for the first time say, I believe today. I want to put my full faith, full trust, full commitment to you, Jesus, and in you, Jesus, if they want to experience that Zoe life today. I just want to encourage anyone in the room who wants to do that, please just we want to raise your hand. I want to acknowledge that you're taking that step forward to walk with him. If there's those in the room who maybe they realize, you know what, I've been... I have been uh, quick to believe in the, oh, I'm going to get heaven someday when I die and realize today, maybe you realize, no, you know what? Jesus has done everything to get heaven into me right now. And I need this Zoe life to shape how I live. I need to receive it new now today and I need to walk it out in God's new world. If that's you, maybe you want to slip up your hand and just say, you know what, today that's, that's what I want to do. I see hands. Praise God. My hand's going up with you. I want to do better at this. Lord, I want to take off my grave clothes, and I want to to walk forward with the new self, totally other than what I used to be. So God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you, Jesus, that you are the resurrection and the life. May we all experience that eternal life today. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, church family, he is risen. All right, we got a lot of cool stuff for you today. We're celebrating big because Jesus is risen from the grave. We have a donut wall out there. Get yourself some fresh donuts. There's a photo booth. You can take a picture with someone, um, someone you love or by yourself or with me, whoever. Come find me if you want to take a picture with me. But have a great rest of the day. And on your way out, say hi to somebody who has access to eternal life today. We'll see you next week.